Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Heritage Foundation. Uh, we apologize. We're running a little bit late, but we had a, an excellent lunch and a lot of excellent conversation. Uh, but we're very pleased to have all of you here this afternoon, and we thank you all for coming uh, to this very special event, the Heritage Foundation's annual BC lecture, BC Lee Lecture. Uh, the BC Lee Lecture is named for the founder of Samsung, a man of vision and an unwavering advocate for the U.S.-Korea alliance and South Korea's role in the world, and also a very remarkable businessman. Uh, we are pleased and indeed honored to have in the audience today Wong Kong Kim as the representative of Samsung. Uh, thank you, sir, for being here. It's really a pleasure to have you here. Uh, the Samsung Group generously endowed this series of annual lectures on Asia uh, two decades ago. Uh, past speakers in our BC Lee Lecture series have included Henry Kissinger, Jesse Helms, Colin Powell, Condi Rice, Joseph Lieberman, and Ed Royce. Last year, Senator Jim Talent gave an excellent speech on China. True to BC Lee's vision, the program highlights not only the critical importance of the U.S.-Korea alliance, but offers an opportunity to think about America's role in the world. And given all the questions raised uh, today about American leadership, that is an opportunity that we welcome in hosting this lecture. The subject of U.S. leadership will, I'm sure, come up in the discussion. No matter what difficulties we face as Americans in the world, it's comforting to know that we are not alone. With friends like South Korea, there is a lot of good left to be done and a lot of danger to our values and prosperity that we must continue to hold at bay. We must confront those dangers together, but we can only do so if we better understand one another. And to improve that understanding is one of the enduring objectives of the BC Lee Lecture Series. But before I introduce our speaker, there are a few people here today that I would like to recognize. Uh, first of all, I welcome the Ambassador from Nepal and the Deputy Chief of Mission from Malaysia. We are honored to have you here. I also want to acknowledge other representatives from the Diplomatic Corps from Australia, China, Denmark, Hong Kong, Laos, Mongolia, Norway, Taiwan, Singapore, South Africa, Sweden, Thailand, and other countries. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce this year's guest, the Honorable Robert B. Zellick. For a man with such a long and distinguished career, it's not easy to do, to do justice to his many accomplishments. But uh, you can see just from hitting the highlights the breadth of his experience. Mr. Zellick was the president of the World Bank Group from 2007 to 2012. Uh, he was U.S. Trade Representative from 2001 to 2005 and Deputy Secretary of State from 2005 to 2006. He is currently the chairman of Goldman Sachs International Advisors. He is also a senior fellow at the Belfer Center at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. He serves on the boards of the National Endowment for Democracy and the Peterson's Institute for International Economics, and he is a member of the Global Leadership Council of Mercy Corps, which is a global humanitarian agency. From 1985 to 1993, he served as counselor to the Secretary of the Treasury and Under Secretary of State, as well as White House Deputy Chief of Staff. Uh, Mr. Zellick holds a JD, a magnum cum laude degree from Harvard's Law School, a master's degree in public policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and a bachelor's degree from Swarthmore College. Thank you, Bob, for, for being with us here today. Uh, you once told me that you practically live on an airplane and you repeated it at lunch, and so uh, we know how busy you are. We are very pleased that you have broken up your busy travel schedule to be with us today. Now, for those of you who regularly attend a BC Lee Lecture, you will note that today's program has a special interview style format. Uh, the interview will be conducted by the founder of the Heritage Foundation and chairman of the Asian Studies Center, Dr. Edwin J. Fulner. I'm fairly certain that most of you know Dr. Fulner well. His 40-plus uh, years of leadership in the conservative movement and his extensive experience in Asia is an unparalleled resource for us here at the Heritage Foundation. And I'm really looking forward to the exchange between these two distinguished gentlemen. So if you will please join me in welcoming Mr. Zellick and Dr. Fulner. Thanks, Bob, for being here with us today. No seatbelt required for the next hour. <laughs> Bob, your 
broad background in, in world politics leads me to the big picture. Uh, America has interests, as we, we all know, in Asia. We also have interests in Europe, obviously in the Middle East, Latin America, emerging Africa, all around the world. How does Asia fit in to that? Well, first, Ed, uh, permit me to thank you and the Heritage Foundation, uh, not only for inviting me today, but uh, as Kim was kind enough to note, when we work together in different capacities, uh, you and Heritage are always very stalwart supporters, particularly on the free trade agenda when we uh, push that, which people can see the importance today as it goes forward into TPP. Um, some of you may note, I gather this is the old Ed Fulner tie as opposed <laughs> to the new one, but he was a good design specialist too, as you go. <laughs> but I, I also um, wanted to just mention, I, I met Thomas, one of the interns, as I came in, and I know there are a number of young people, either as uh, junior staff here at Heritage, and we were talking a little bit about the, this at lunch about the background of history for foreign policy. So as I, uh, as I answer some of these questions, uh, permit me, I'm going to try to draw some historical reference points because I hope to, one of the advantages for those of you here at Heritage, you've got some tremendous experience in the staff here and I hope that you can also build on that because I think it makes for better, better policy making. So to start with Ed's basic question, and again, as a little historical reference point, um, many of you uh, know about the Federalist Papers, which were written um, at the time of our Constitutional Convention. Uh, you'll find, I think, it, if I recall right, it was Federalist Number 4, written by John Jay, talking about the reason why you needed a strong federal government for a constitution. And he talks about um, the challenges that the new young United States uh, would face in Asia, and talking about China and India, if I recall, in particular. Um, so in that sense, the United States' connectivity with Asia goes back to our very founding. In military and security terms, uh, I guess really since uh, Admiral Dewey defeated the Spanish fleet uh, in Manila, the United States became clearly a key sort of military power, so that's been over 100 years. But I think uh, what I want to say that may be a little different on this is that sometimes people talk about the importance of Asia vis-a-vis -vis other regions in the context of the Obama administration's discussion of pivot or rebalance. Well, clearly Asia is critical uh, for, for U.S. interests, economic, security, cultural, historical. But I take a slightly different view on this pivot idea, because I think it's important to recognize the United States is a global power. And in my experience, uh, when the United States is exercising influence, hopefully successfully, whether it's in Europe or the Middle East or others, this is recognized in Asia, just as the United States' influence in Asia is recognized in other regions. So I think part of the challenge is not one region or another but how the United States sees its global equities and performance in a way that can capitalize on this. And again, let me give you another historical reference point, but one that's a little bit more modern. I worked for Secretary of the Treasury and then Secretary of State James Baker for eight years. So many people will associate the 89-92 time frame as the critical events uh, with the end of the Soviet Union, German unification 25 years ago uh, this month, uh, end of the Cold War. Uh, at the same time, we had the first Gulf War and a uh, worldwide coalition. We had the start of the Madrid peace process. So dominating events for an administration of Europe and the Middle East. But what's interesting to recall is that's the same time period in which the United States started and completed the NAFTA for North American Free Trade Agreement, key for our, our, our own continental base. But also, that was when APEC was launched in 1989, which we saw was important with the end of the Cold War, sort of an economic foundation. Uh, with Japan, this only your specialist will recall this, but actually, through Secretary Baker, we launched something called the Structural Impediments Initiative with Japan, which really was trying to go at some of the same issues that Prime Minister Abe is now talking about with the Third Arrow and the TPP mm -hmm. was all about. Um, 
Obviously, with the terrible events of Tiananmen Square, there was an important step taken in 91 and 92 where we brought China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong into APEC. It was part of a way of bringing China back on the economic reform path, but also in a way that supported our partners uh, in Taiwan and with the idea of strengthening Hong Kong's position. And since we've got a Korean connection here, many people will forget Korea didn't even have diplomatic relations with China at that point. But Korea was the host of the APEC meeting, and in the process of doing that, we helped actually build the relationship between Korea and China, and I think over the long term that's actually going to be very important in dealing with the North Korean picture. But I just cite that as an example of the fact that I don't think it's Asia or Europe or the Middle East, uh, and actually I think when the United States is perceived as withdrawing, as we're now being seen in, in the Middle East and Gulf, it actually doesn't strengthen our position in Asia, I actually think it weakens it. So the challenge is how the United States is able to leverage its global power and relationships, security, economics, political values, uh, and it can be done. Mm -hmm. In your, your key work with the Bush 43 administration, President George W. Bush, obviously Iraq, Afghanistan were, were critical focus points. Mm -hmm. Did we take our eyes off of Asia too much at that point? Yeah, I know that's a subject of debate. Uh, and again, to, to relate to the first answer, I think one has to be careful. I think one of the Obama administration's justification for withdrawing in the Mideast and Gulf, which by the way, if you look at Secretary Kerry's schedule, has not been very <laughs> successful, um, was the idea of, okay, well, we need to focus on Asia. And this is where, again, I, I think a little historical perspective is useful. Let's take the trade agenda and the United States engagement across the Pacific. Well, in the Bush 43 administration, we negotiated the free trade agreement with Singapore, we negotiated it with Australia, we negotiated it with Korea. Uh, we tried with Thailand, but with the change of government, uh, we're unsuccessful. Um, in Japan, which is a key relationship, again, this is sort of more hasn't been discussed widely, but there was a deepening of some of the intelligence relations with Asia, and people remember the Bush-Koizumi relationship was quite strong. Part of it with Japan, it depends somewhat on the prime ministers you have and sort of their ability uh, to engage. Um, you know, while it didn't bear fruit, this was the launch with South Korea, the six-party talks. With China, um, you completed China's accession to the WTO and I, when I was Deputy Secretary, launched the first strategic dialogue with the Chinese on issues that frankly was done in a way quite different than the talking point big shop now that they've got. And Hank Paulson, who built it in strategic uh, economic dialogue, obviously uh, quite significant. But beyond that, think about, again, this is how people lose sight of this. After 9-11, there was a real concern about what would happen in Indonesia, the largest mm -hmm. Muslim country in the world. And you know, you know, if, if you got you mentioned Australians being here, people remember the terrorist uh, incidents that killed a number of Australians. There was a lot of work by the U.S. government, Australia, and others to try to work with Indonesia to deal with the terrorist threat, deal with the democratic evolution, deal with some of the economic changes. And another big one was India. Mm -hmm. India is a good example of kind of the influence of a of a, a strong-willed ambassador, Bob Blackwell, who was kind of knew what the president wanted to do to really transform the strategic basis of that relationship. So there was a lot going on. Uh, undoubtedly, you know, there's no doubt that you've got some of the key cabinet principles focused on sort of fighting the wars and conflict, but I, I frankly think this has been somewhat overstated for the reason I mentioned. Mm -hmm. But I want to make one other reference point, because <clears throat> I understand he may be here tomorrow. Uh, Senator Dan Sullivan of Alaska. When I was leaving as Deputy Secretary in 2006, one of the things that I uh, did was to bring in Dan Sullivan, who was Assistant Secretary for Economic Bureau, uh, John Hillen, who was the political and military affairs and had a, was a decorated combat officer in the first Gulf War, Oxford PhD, really brought heritage alum. Yes, and brought <laughs> po political and military affairs back to kind of its sort of uh, its core role. And Hank Crumpton, who some of you from the Intel community know is sort of a hero at the agency dealing with Afghanistan. 
And I said to the three of them, look, um, I'm going to be going, but it's very important we keep ties with Southeast Asia. And I want the three of you to actually kind of work as a team with intel issues and terrorism, with uh, economic issues, with Paul Mill issues, and get out to the region and develop kind of the relationships. And I think that's important too. I mean, not only because you know you now have a U.S. senator who's had that sort of basis with Asia, uh, and you'll see tomorrow or another occasion kind of his depth of interest with it, but I also think it's important at another level. Sometimes. Um, the way the media and the public fasten on things, it's kind of like, did the secretary of this department or that department go to the meeting? Did they get the photo op? You know, we've seen this with Hillary Clinton, kind of how many miles they traveled. I think that's a mistaken way to look at foreign policy. I think it's a question of not only what you accomplish, but frankly, what I, when I was in an executive role, I was always trying to engage multiple levels. I think one of the dangers in U.S. foreign policy over my experience is that we used to have assistant secretaries play much more significant roles than they're playing now because it's all, you know, is the secretary here, there, or others. And I think that weakens your ability to do what I said, which is to kind of play at multiple levels, different levels in multiple theaters uh, at one time. Yeah. The two points that, that really stick out in what you just said, number one, this kind of top-down, which uh, decapitates the middle level and, and the key policy actors, but the other one is, the notion that January of every fourth year, history starts anew, and as if you didn't inherit something. So come January 2017, perhaps there'll be somebody new in the White House. Well, there will there be somebody will new. There certainly will be, unless, no, sure unless will we be make a new. big constitutional <laughs> change. How, how should we now and then be thinking about China? I mean, China's as you say, it goes back to Federalist Papers, but really it goes to Nixon, and you've been such a critical actor in, in so many roles along the way in terms of the U.S.-China relationship. Um, strategic challenges up to yesterday, uh, uh, U.S. warship uh, in the South China Sea. Uh, how should we be evolving in terms of our thinking about China? Strategic partner, challenge, uh, what are they? What is well, it? well I, I think the starting point, and your, your questions in a way set a good context of this, is that when the U.S. thinks about its policy or strategy with China, we need to think about it regionally and even globally. So I start out actually thinking about our alliance relationships in the region. <clears throat> um, there are often particular bilateral issues, but there's often regional issues. Japan, South Korea, Australia, Philippines, Thailand. Um, partners such as Singapore. Um, and part of it is that together we're going to need to uh, show to the Chinese, without belligerence but with firmness, kind of how there are norms and rules of behavior of the international order that serve China quite well over the course of its development and that there will be resistance, for example, on freedom of navigation if China uh, changes that. There are new issues such as the cyber agenda. Um, where, uh, frankly, you know, I think people are not only appreciating kind of the potential danger, but in some ways they're trying to come up with kind of new frameworks of how we deal with this, just as people did with nuclear weaponry, you know, 60 or 70 years ago. <clears throat> um, and so the starting point is your allies and partners. I think, uh, second, it'll be important to work with China on issues where there are disagreements. I mentioned South China Sea, I mentioned uh, cyber, um, and not in a way that uh, sort of uh, treats the Chinese with lack of respect, but nevertheless is firm about kind of why and kind of not only the U.S. interests, but sort of the global interests in this. Some of the things I discussed actually with China uh, in the course of the strategic dialogue, let me give you one because we sure. talked about Korea as a context. It's an interesting example. Uh, my counterpart was Dai Bing Guo, who went on to become the state counselor. And we, we had these dialogues with a very small number of people, four or five people, and it was kind of free-ranging for long periods of time. And I remember at one point saying, look, um, let's just make an assumption that someday uh, Korea gets unified. And I don't, I'm not trying to say I'm precipitating a crisis in the North or others, but let's just assume that happens. 
is that it's important for China to think about the fact of should the United States keep an alliance relationship with Korea? The first Chinese response would be, oh no, because we don't want US forces on the Yalu. You know, they haven't wanted that since 1953. I said, but frankly, I don't think the US would keep a very large ground force. I think it'd probably be more air and naval assets in the South. I said, but also think about the implications. Do the next sort of steps of chess moves. If South Korea loses the alliance with the United States and sees itself in a world with Russia, China, Japan, and by the way, if it inherits a nuclear weapon, might there be voices in Korea that says we should keep it? And if Korea keeps a nuclear weapon and Japan looks around and says, oh, Russia, China, you know, Japan, or Korea, others all have nuclear weapons, we don't, what might that do in Japan? Or what might it do to public opinion in Japan to think about the other big ally of the US in North Asia no longer has the ties? So I was trying to prod the, Jap the Chinese to think about some of these structural changes in a way and I think that's part of what the, the challenge of a strategy is. Another one, frankly, is, you know, again, I'm not trying to forecast, but if you had some terrible events happen in the North and you've got nuclear materials there, who's going to secure them? You know, will the South Korean military go in? Will the Chinese go in? Will the U.S. go in? People ought to have some sense of what that might be. So there's, on security, there's areas where we need to make sure the norms, we need to deal with new and changing issues. Frankly, I think that the, the toughest issues will be in the Asia Pacific. What I actually discovered at the World Bank and at State and USTR is that in issues dealing with, um, you know, uh, African development and others, you could work with the Chinese. We were talking a little bit about Afghanistan and Pakistan to sort of see commonality of interest. And then that leaves you the economics. And I, you know, I continue to believe that what the reformers in China want in terms of trying to move from the old growth model to one based more on services and consumption and domestic demand is in our interest as well as theirs. You only have to read the business pages if people think that China is in a difficult circumstance, it's going to have uh, negative effects for everybody. So I think, frankly, there are areas, whether it be bilateral investment treaty, services discussion in the WTO, um, frankly, uh, let me give you an example of how a little creative policy making could influence this. Some of you know about the special drawing rights uh, in the IMF and that China has exhibited an interest in being considered a reserve currency. Well, China doesn't have an open capital market today, so it really doesn't qualify under the IMF terms. But if I were in the U.S. Treasury, I would go to Governor Zhou of the People's Bank of China, who's a reformer, and I would say, what are the three things that you uh, would like to get done in your own system in terms of opening up the financial sector? And then I'd go back to the IMF and I'd say, let's create a special group of countries who are part of the, um, the SDR. So you'd have the Eurozone, you'd have the US, you'd have Britain and the pound, you'd have Japan. And then I'd say, if China does these three things, We'll make it an observer in this group. And then I'd think of the next few things that China would do. So I'd be helping Governor Zhou get the reforms to move to an open capital account, which is what the US wants. And, and frankly, if in the end of the day you created a group of those five or six people in monetary affairs, that wouldn't be such a bad group to have around when circumstances occur. And what I'm just playing on is the idea that uh, Zhu Ranji in the 90s used the WTO accession to push forward Chinese okay. reforms. With a little creativity, there are ways we could do that with China in a constructive part. But I think to back away from this, the challenge for U.S. policy, and you know, people here are well aware of it, heritage will play a key role in this, there's a, there's a scratchiness now about China because of the business community, because of the security incidents and others. And I think that you know, one of the challenges will be sort of finding the right balance here in terms of sending the signals about China, what won't be accepted, better if we can do it in concert with partners and allies, but then also saying to the Chinese, we're not trying to contain you, because that won't work. It won't work with China, and it won't work the, with our partners in Asia. A mm -hmm. couple specific things on U.S.-China economic relationship. Number one is, is kind of taking your SDR example as primary to, say, how China thinks about the commons, whether it's sea lanes, whether it's cyber, whether it's space. Uh, are they coming along? 
Are they, are they moving the right I guess it's kind of uneven, you'd have yeah, to Yeah, that's right, and it's a mixed situation. I mean, so, you know, when I was at the World Bank, uh, I found China to be pretty cooperative on things, uh, raising money for the very poorest countries. Frankly, on some of the issues, as I mentioned, in Africa, where some of the resource development had led a bad reputation for Africa, and, or for China in Africa, and for some of the corruption issues. Um, uh, you know, if you think about the financial crisis, Hank Paulson has this wonderful little anecdote where the Russians were saying, you know, look, let's figure out a way we could use our dollar reserves to really squeeze the United States in a moment of weakness. And the Chinese are saying, well, wait a minute, you know, we don't want to screw up the world economic yeah, system. Yeah, it's a yeah. different perspective. Um, the one that got in the news recently, and the president was just here, is the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And I, I wrote a piece in the Financial Times. I think the administration was wrong on this. I think, and in fact, it's dangerous because, you know, if, if you want to say to the, the Chinese, look, there's a reason why we want to keep the freedom of navigation and the reason why we are drawing these principles on cyber. But then, frankly, when the Chinese come up with a reasonable idea, if you just automatically say no, well, then, you know, you're undercutting your own credibility. And I don't, frankly, there's a lot of need for infrastructure investment. The Chinese started this one, and they even did this one different than the BRICS Bank, with President Jin, who's had a good international reputation. He hired a former American lawyer from the World Bank to help do the governance structure. Um, he's brought in other, mm -hmm. this week he even mentioned, he said, look, we will be open for procurement to US companies even if you're not a member. And we will mm -hmm. also be open for staff. He's bending over backwards to try to do the things sensible. And frankly, one of the main U.S. complaints was, oh, well, you won't have an on-site board. Well, I had an on-site board at the World Bank, and it was 300 people and $70 million a year and had board meetings multiple times a week, and anything serious, I'd have to go to capital. So it was created before the era of air travel. They're smart not to have an on-site board. So, and then frankly, just as a diplomat, if you're going to draw a line on something, it's probably best to do it uh, in one you've got a fair chance of succeeding. And so to draw a line on a mistaken issue and to lose is not my idea of a diplomatic yeah. and success. To, and to jump in at the last minute the way we did. And, well, and, and here, and this say, is yeah. a small point, but again, it shows where some, and I mentioned this to somebody in the administration recently. When I was at the World Bank, we were kind of trying to move back in the infrastructure space, but we we're trying to do so with public-private partnerships. And there's a lot of capital and interest in doing this. But they're still one-off transactions. So I created a hub in Singapore where I wanted to look at the flow of transactions and tried to say, where would the World Bank's money be most effective? Equity, mezzanine, guarantees, others. And we created a billion dollar fund with the Singaporeans, who are not known for throwing money away, to try to do public-private partnerships. Well, the most natural thing for the administration to do, because frankly, I wouldn't want to take this thing to Congress to get funding either, would say, look, let's have a partnership with the Infra hub, infrastructure private partnership hub in Singapore, part of the World Bank. It'll draw the institutions together. It'll focus on public-private partnerships. It'll have the right standards. You know, I mean, just to give you again, this is where initiative. When I met President Jin on last week, I have this. When I was at the World Bank, I tried to do this project to save the 3,500 tigers left in the wild, and. It's now been ended by the World Bank, so the Tiger Range countries have actually come back to me and some others and would like us to keep it going. And so I said to Chairman Jin, look, as opposed to being on defense on environmental safeguards, why don't you be on offense? There's some interesting work done on smart green infrastructure, how you can create infrastructure that allows wildlife corridors, which you need for tigers moving mm -hmm, large spaces. Mm -hmm. And he took it, and I may have an interest in moving it forward. You know, so. Again, is a, it's, it's part of the challenge in foreign policy or economic, is how do you anticipate? How, and, how, and the U.S. of all countries has had at least 70 years of experience of working these systems globally. We should use a little bit of what we got. It doesn't always have to be money. It doesn't always have to be military force. It can be brains and, and experience. Well, and, and part of it is that optimism that you're reflecting right now, too. Yeah. It's uh, not being on the defensive all the time. It's not, frankly, leading from behind. It's, it's saying, hey, we do have a role, and, and let's, let's figure out how to, how to do that more positively. What is one belt, one road? Yeah, this is one of those reasons why diplomats, fortunately, have an existence, because it's a specialty field that doesn't make sense to people. Um, the one belt, one road, of course, is the Chinese uh, development concept, but the belt is actually the uh, 
development across Central Asia, the road, which most of us think is terrestrial, is actually the sea lanes. But the, we were talking a little bit about this. I think it's very important that people in Washington and Europe uh, recognize, I think, the Chinese are very serious about this from an economic development perspective, from a perspective of uniting Eurasia in a way that perhaps you haven't seen since Marco Polo or mm -hmm. the Great Silk Road. And there will be implications for it of many types across Central Asia, across economics and others that are just beginning. So again, it's another issue where people should recognize it's real and how can we affect it positively. Let's move uh, northeast. Japan, Prime Minister Abe, a little controversial, both in the region and uh, around the world, uh, has a, a foreign policy that's not necessarily understood by his neighbors. How do you, how do you define, well, first I assume that we, we concur that the U.S.-Japanese relationship is kind of the linchpin of, of our relationships in Asia. Uh, very much, of course, antecedent to the U.S. ROK relationship, because if we ever do have to come to defense of Korea, it's going to be based in Japan, et cetera. But what should we be thinking about Abe right now as he talks about a more assertive uh, Japan's role in the world? Uh, well, I think Abe has done some very important things, and I think he has a chance to be a really historic prime minister for Japan. I think it's important to understand the context. In his own way, like Xi Jinping, it's not that he woke up one morning and discovered Milton Friedman and decided to do economic reforms. What motivates Abe is the fact that Japan is roughly losing 250,000 people a year because of demographics. And he wants Japan to be an influence in the region. And I think that's in Japan's interest and in our interest. So take the first, the, the security steps. I, I think uh, this is very important, and in fact, probably like many of the people at Heritage have looked at this issue, I always worried about the old guidelines, which many people are unaware of, which basically said that, you know, if the U.S., if you, you could have a U.S. ship attack, the Japanese ship next to it, and unless the attack were related to Japan, the Japanese ship couldn't engage. If that ever happened, you, goodbye to the alliance. So I think sharing the notion of a true alliance partner is a very important step. I think part of the sensitivity in this, I was talking with a Japanese friend, is part of the older generation who like the old arrangement, mm -hmm. but in some ways this is the challenge of sharing broader responsibilities. But also I think it's, it will be important for Abe to calm people about the nature of what he's done as opposed to trying to push a Japanese militarism, which I don't think is his aim. Second, on the economic side, uh, he knows that unless he gets Japan's economy sort of moving forward again, that will also be less influential. So you have the three arrows, the monetary, the fiscal mm -hmm. policy, and the big challenge now is the structural reforms. And this is partly, I hope, where TPP, the trade agreement, will help him. But it's also pressed him to do things that might seem out of the ordinary. Because of the demographic issue, if you look at the role of women in the workforce in Japan, it's much more limited. It's true in Korea, too, compared to the U.S. or Europe. The former Swedish finance minister, Anders Borg, a very smart guy, did a back-of-the-envelope calculation that said if the participation of Japanese women in the workforce were like that of Europe, not just Scandinavia, it had increased GDP by about 8%. Wow. So, and you see Abe talking about kind of how to make it easier with child care, how to sort of increase women. You could let in immigrants, but that's not likely going to happen. Yeah. So, so that's a development. I think the area where I wish uh, there were a little bit more movement was, as you said, I think the relations in the region are very important. Uh, Australia, India, those are good relations with Japan. Uh, Korea is obviously, for historical reasons, uh, and personal reasons been extremely difficult. And it just, history would suggest if you're the power that kind of was the overlord, it's, it becomes you to be more gracious in the process. And so, I, particularly with the mm -hmm. comfort women, I worry about this one because those women will, will, will pass on. And there'll be a missed opportunity for Japan not to really 
kind of come to terms with that piece of history. And if it could do so while the women were alive, I think it would be very significant to do. Now, if you talk to you know Japanese friends, there's different sensitivities here about history and relationships with some of the Korean leaders. I'm not insensitive to that, but for the long term, as you mentioned, it's in Korea's interest to have a good partnership with Japan, depending on what happens in North Korea. And I believe it's in Japan's interest to have a good relationship with Korea. So the United States should do what it can to facilitate that, recognizing that some of these wounds and sensitivities run very deep. And so how we approach it has to be done carefully. Very, very carefully. Yeah. You mentioned TPP. Of course, uh, Japan's in, Korea's not. Uh, Clinton was, Hillary Clinton was in, she's not. Uh, we've got a different set of Washington uh, uh, perspectives on TPP. You were there for NAFTA, you were there for some of the real groundbreaking opening things. Uh, was, was TPP everything we wanted? Was it a, a good step? How, how, do you, how do you look at it now? Well, we don't, they haven't released the final terms, but I mean the general sense is that it'll be very important, and it goes back a little bit to the reference point I made about the creation of APEC. It was a recognition that much of the U.S. relationship across the Asia Pacific after World War II was based on security ties and then helping Japan and South Korea develop. And frankly, to support our own interests, to have public support, we need to recognize the economic ties. In addition, Asia is now so significant that if we can influence the rules, not only on opening markets, but different intellectual property, different transparency, other things, it will have some global effects. So I think I, I, TPP will not be easy to get done, and I frankly think you know, the administration hasn't yet focused on kind of the, the how, how to, to do, do it, it, and so conversations I've had in Congress, it's kind of ambiguous. I think it'll be important to try to get done in 2016 because who knows what happens with the Senate or, or you had 28 Democrats courageously vote for uh, TPA and you know uh, those people I think will continue to vote for it because they've crossed the Rubicon with the unions and the opponents. But you know what will happen to them? Um, so I was a little worried at first that President Obama wouldn't push this issue in 2016 because it obviously causes a problem with the Democratic Party and uh, Secretary Clinton. But I think his own belief in his legacy will kind of push it forward. But, but to see the bigger issue here, I think if I were in the administration now, if I really want to make TPP not only important for those 12 countries, but also for others, I'd be thinking about what's the process by which Korea might come in, or, or frankly, you know, others in ASEAN. I was even talking to the Mongolian prime minister who wanted to emphasize economic reform, but to make it a living agreement. And here, again, a little historical context is useful. Probably this audience knows, but most don't. Of the 11 other countries the U.S. is negotiating with, in six of them we already have free trade agreements. So Canada, Mexico, Chile, Peru, uh, Australia, and Singapore. I don't believe you would have been able, knowing how I negotiated a number of those agreements is that each of those had difficult issues. I don't believe they would have gotten TPP through if they didn't have that foundation. We need to build on the foundation. And by the way, this also suggests what could be done with the transatlantic, and also I hope this might affect some things with other developing countries in the WTO context. So it's your point about needing to be on offense. But Politics is what it is. You can't do it all at once. So part of it is kind of, can you get momentum that then you or somebody else can build on at a later point? But then fundamentally, in terms of how you look at international trade agreements, uh, bilateral or regional ones like a TPP are, are a good step in the right direction if you can't do it worldwide. Well, yes. I made a big, uh, this was a sensitive or controversial topic with the Financial Times and others. When I was U.S. Trade Representative, I said we need to move globally, regionally, and bilaterally. And the idea, frankly, was if one of 150 economies in the WTO stopped this, I didn't want to be stopped. Mm -hmm. And it's a partly basic negotiating. I mean, if you go back and look at the closing of the, the Uruguay round, it was influential that the United States had done NAFTA and started APEC. This pushed the Europeans in the process. Uh, you know. When I took office, we were negotiating a free trade area of the Americas. I knew it was unlikely to happen with Venezuela and Argentina and others. But look, we've created free trade agreements now with over 50% of the non-US GDP in the hemisphere. So who knows? Maybe 
after Brazil gets through this period and they want to move some reforms, maybe we could kind of return to that and create mm -hmm. sort of a sort of a broader regional group. That's sort of what's happening in in, uh, in TPP as well. So at the same time, however, because the U.S. is a global leader, I think it's important we not ignore the WTO and the global side. And the part of the challenge now in the WTO is to get all the economies to agree to all these topics at once. But I, the service sector is interesting. There's a negotiation going on that was designed differently. So only the countries that agree to take part in it will get the benefits of it. And this brings us back to the China case. <clears throat> One of the requirements, without getting too wonkish on this, is you agree to a negative list. Trade people are always backwards, so negative is good. <laughs> what negative means is, is that unless you specify the sector, it's open. Positive list means only the sectors you specify. The Chinese have agreed to the principle of a negative list, which is much more than Brazil or India have done. Mm -hmm. Right now, their list of exceptions is too long. But, and, and so the US has not accepted them in this negotiation. But it's a good example of how I would be working with the Chinese to say, look, you want to strengthen the service sector. You want to do what Zhu Ranji did. Let's get that group down and then try to do this in a way that boosts uh, the WTO. Um, the administration did this constructively uh, on the ITA, the Information Technology Agreement, the second one. And they, this was a good idea and something I'd mentioned to Mike Froman. The Chinese were hosting APEC. They want to have a win. I said, so use that as kind of a deadline to kind of push this forward. And I'll point out to people that, that China's going to be hosting the G20 next year. You know, it would be a good opportunity to kind of push the Chinese on some of these issues. So I think that the key would be all three. And, uh, and you know, it's kind of, in some ways, there's a military analogy here. You know, I want to be able to envelop from, mm -hmm. from different directions. Mm -hmm. And by the way, there's Wait. a pol political point on this, too we talked about, which is obviously trade issues are difficult with the Congress. But my challenge, my belief is they don't get easier if you ignore them. You know, and so one of the problems with free trade is, you know, this administration will not use the term NAFTA because they just think it's so bad. If you actually look at a lot of the polling, NAFTA can do okay, but it's a little hard to win a debate if you never take the other side, right? And so uh, I think part of the challenge here in, that President Obama encountered with TPA was for six years he wasn't doing anything on trade, then he goes to his caucus and says, hey, I need you to turn around and support me. The groundwork hadn't been laid. So one of the benefits of even the smaller free trade agreements you did is it gets Congress used to the idea that free trade is not you know, deadly or life or death, and it keeps the process of, of openness moving forward. I, I'm a big believer that is you know, kind of in momentum and kind of setting things up. And, and I think in trade, we have to have a continual agenda. Geographically, having talked about Japan and a little bit about Korea, which I'll come back to in a minute, swing down to the other end of what, what we consider Asia anyway, India. Uh, boy, what you and, the, and Bush 43 did in terms of the U.S.-Indian bilateral relationship was really historic and very, very positive. Uh, you talked about Ambassador Blackwell and his role, but, but it really... It was the leadership back here that really pushed that along. But talk to us about where we are now with the, the current president and where we, where we can be going in yeah. terms of the, both the bilateral and the regional issues. Well, I appreciate you noting for the president, Blackwell, and others, I do think this is one of those key strategic shifts. And just to remind people, for 40 or 50 years, whenever you mentioned India, people always had to mention Pakistan. And people often called it the hyphenization of the policy. Not surprisingly, <laughs> India, whatever the challenges in Pakistan, India was moving in a different direction. It was important to treat India separately and not only see it as a challenge with Pakistan. Obviously, part of it is the relation with Southeast Asia. You know, they, call, they didn't call it Indochina for nothing, right? It's this in-between region here. And, and, and also China. Um, I think uh, having said that, Americans have to be careful because you, sometimes people say, oh, world's biggest democracy, a natural ally. This is where history and culture is important. India, particularly after the colonial experience, is a little prickly about its independence and sovereignty. And so it, I don't think it's going to fit into a natural alliance relationship. It doesn't want to be a junior partner of the United States. Mm -hmm. So we need to approach it with that as a context. And then find, and this is where, again, a little creativity comes in mind about where are common interests. 
One is clearly naval, because uh, the other side of the one belt, one road is the Chinese naval presence in the Indian Ocean. So I think the types of, of uh, exercises that the United States and I think Japan, maybe Australia, were doing with India is very important. Um, I think uh, another is frankly going to need to go to some of the newer issues on cybersecurity. Um, and then third, frankly, this is where I would, you know, it's a good lesson of diplomacy is talk to your colleagues and see what are their priorities. I think one of the ones you'll find now for Modi is infrastructure. Um, there are things that, that I think the United States and others, not so much public capital, but private capital and others could do to support that. I think in general, the Indian economic development process is not going to be a big bang. It's going to have fits and starts. This is in part because Modi or any Indian prime minister is sensitive to some of the broad sort of social uh, issues. I think it's likely to move state by state. You know, when people ask me about Indian development, I often say, which India? Because some states will have different reform programs. But I think uh, if I were in office, I'd be sitting with the Indians to say, well, what can we do to deepen this? This is another sensitive issue on the US side, but it's interesting. You know, the Indian Institutes of Technology produce some incredibly capable graduates, most of whom couldn't find good opportunities in India. They came to the United States. Some of them built great businesses, and now they've got they're going back, or at least having two-way business connections. And that sort of shows the benefit. You know, the US ace in the hole is it's an attractive place to live and do business and- And get an education. And too. get an education. And so actually, you know, whether it's H-1B visas or others connectivity, this can all be part of a relationship mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. with these countries. And then, and then I think, uh, you know, this is the other side of the Pakistan issue. We're not through with the dangers of terrorism. And if you actually think about the Pakistani terrorists that attacked India and the fact that they were actually restrained in response was sort of quite disciplined. But it does mean that the focus of Pakistan is also going to have to be on who's controlling or supplying or supporting those terrorist groups. Yeah, yeah. Bob, as a student of history, we've got the 25th anniversary of uh, German reunification. You were there, you were intimately involved in leading the way from Washington in terms of supporting the government then in Bonn and eventually in Berlin. Is there anything to be learned there in terms of the current Korean situation? Yeah, it's interesting. I think Heritage had sponsored some groups on this too. There was a industry, a cottage industry in the 90s, kind of looking at sort of what experience can be drawn. The circumstances are obviously very different. There's discussion in Korea today about this, again, where people are trying to prepare. I think um, the, the, the major contextual point is if one recalls Europe in 1989, even after 40 years of West Germany demonstrating that it was a very good European partner, when the moment came, a lot of others in Europe were not so excited about this. Nervous. Yeah. With Thatcher point about she loved Germany so much she wanted to have two of them. Um, so uh, I think it's important for Korea to you know, prepare by trying to develop relationships. This is part of the story of China. It's obviously the U.S. is a sort of a key player. It goes a little bit to our point about Japan. It also, and I think Korea has done this, President Lee started to do this, uh, and, and President Park I think has continued, is to say China is a great, or South Korea is a great development success story. And if you go back and look in 1953, you know, it was much worse than Egypt. Its success is enormous. So it was developing a deeper partnership with the World Bank. It was playing a role in the G20 process and others. I think that's all to the good is, is Korea sort of sees itself as a kind of a medium level power that kind of reaches out. Australia, I think, picked up on this and was doing some things with Korea just because you can never predict these moments, but when they come, you want to try to have as good and strong relations. And this goes back to your question on Japan. Again, I understand the sensitivities, but if, if a moment of destiny ever comes, you definitely want Japan to be a supportive player of this, which means kind of both sides have an interest in kind of moving it forward. Another, I guess, lesson <clears throat> going back to the German unification experience is it's very hard to predict particular events. I mean, this is what the intelligence agency learned, whether it's 9-11 or Pearl Harbor or other things. You, you can anticipate trends. It goes, I think anticipation is very important. 
And so it'll be important for the United States and others to kind of recognize um, kind of, you know, how to position uh, itself and other players on this. Um, I do think that another issue is kind of you have to deal, the economic challenges would be far greater than East Germany was, and East Germany was hard enough. <clears throat> so this would all go to the point about actually what Korea can do to make its own economy more flexible and more adaptable would certainly be important in the event that you have uh, an opportunity uh, to the north. And from the U.S. point of view, just as with Germany, uh, we have to recognize is that, you know, we have a longstanding partnership. We have an obligation. I think the good news is we saw this in German unification. <clears throat> Sometimes the American people get in trouble because we think the rest of the world thinks like us. But now and then, the fraternity with freedom that Americans have is a very important thing. And it certainly helped the Germans <laughs> because the average American said, well, of course, you know, Germans will want to unify. That wasn't the view in every other European country. No, no. So I think the closer ties between Korea and the United States as the types of things you're doing here are very important. As, as you talk about that, it, it reminds me that you as a, uh, as a trained lawyer, the rule of law and what you were saying about India and the colonial uh, result of India, but by gosh, it did have some positive implications for India in terms of there was a, a, a rule of law that was consistent there. Uh, kind of uneven throughout Asia. Uh, are we moving in the right direction? That, that question's kind of planted by me my friend Alan Meltzer at the Hoover Institution who has a big project going on the worldwide rule of law. You know? Well, I think this is the dimension, you know, there's always the challenge in U.S. policy. We've got security interests, economic interests. We also have values. And I think the rule of law is the entry point into uh, helping to move societies or the international system in a more constructive form. You know, I, I often reflect when I was I was in Hong Kong on a loose fellowship in 1980, and I was teaching uh, Chinese students in Hong Kong. And when I would talk about democracy, this was, remember, just after Deng Xiaoping had taken power, so they're very excited. They were saying, oh, well, it may exist in Japan in some one-party form, but, you know, democracy doesn't fit Asians. And it's just interesting, you know, to see in one lifetime. So we have, you know, obviously competitive elections in Japan, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, uh, Indonesia, the Philippines. So I, uh, I know that this is you know one of the big debates after the Gulf Wars with the United States trying to impose democracy. Obviously, it's difficult in an insecure environment, and it's difficult at the barrel of a gun. I do believe that the economic, the rule of law, the societal connections do move things or can move things in a positive direction. Now, there's no you know exact formula. You know, there you'll find many historians that also talk about how you know economic integration doesn't necessarily lead to peace. You know, witness 1914 <laughs> mm -hmm. in Europe. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you know, I think it's a way that the United States can continue to kind of uh, advance our values as well as our interests together. And I think the rule of law agenda is a very constructive one. Just you know, when I was at the World Bank, I had you know 188. Uh, members. They were all different political systems. I, I could often find issues like rule of law development, anti-corruption, frankly women and gender, where if you frame it in a way that sort of shows their interests, so to, to take the gender issue, I said, look, I think women's equality is the fair and right thing to do, but it's also smart economics. If you ignore 50 percent of your population, what will it do? If you do it in that way as opposed to seeing it as a club and hectoring people, you can make a lot of progress on these things. It's not inevitable. It's not a straight line, but it's where I think it's worth ongoing attention and investment. It kind of brings me to the last point I wanted to raise, human rights. How does that fit into this, particularly the last few comments that you made? Well, since we start with some history, uh, uh, for those of you that were permitted wallets, um, either now or later, check at a dollar bill in your pocket. 
okay? Because what you'll see in a dollar bill, you can take it out and you don't have to give it to the Heritage Foundation. After. <laughs> but you'll see on the back of a dollar bill the Great Seal of the United States. And on the obverse side, there's a unfinished pyramid uh, with the Eye of Providence over it. And uh, there's a wonderful story about this. That seal was commissioned in 1776. It, was, it actually took until, I think, 18, or 1783 to complete. It took as long as to fight the Revolutionary War. But there are two Virgilian phrases on it. One is, uh, he favors our undertaking. Uh, and the other is um, Novus Ordo Seclorum, New Order, order of the of Ages. And when the seal was introduced to the, uh, the Continental Congress, or at this time after the independence had been achieved, Charles Thompson, the, the Secretary of the Congress, said, this is the dawn of a new American era. And it began in 1776. And my first diplomatic history professor said, much of US history is captured in whether he meant American to be geographically limiting or broadly descriptive of the global situation. <laughs> and so I think human rights is part of what America stands for and believes in, and we should always be comfortable with that. The question is how best to do it. And we talked a little bit about that in sort of rule of law and economics. You know, just to go back to our China example, in my strategic discussions with the Chinese, I would say, Look, I know Chinese history, and I know the anxiety about um, kind of religious movements that undermined the empire, whether it was the Boxer Rebellion, whether it was the, um, the one in the 1850s, um, huh? Taiping Rebellion. Rebellion. And of course, this is remembered how upset the Chinese were when they learned about um, the uh, more recent sort of religious movements that had caused turmoil, or it, because they was they didn't know about it, it was fearful. Uh, and so, but I would say, look, when you're successful economically, you're going to discover that people aren't just satisfied with material things. They'll want to have aspects of the soul, and and rather than try to make religion your opponent, you should create space for it. You should create an opportunity in society. Now, I'm not saying that people kind of. Oh, turned uh, these overnight, but you know, frankly, I made the same point in Vietnam, and goes back to TPP. When we did a bilateral agreement with Vietnam, we got some movement on religious liberty. I think the, the U.S. government is getting some movement now on these issues. So, I think there's many opportunities for the United States, at a minimum, to stand for what we believe. But it, I think, it's most effective if we work with countries in explaining. You know how it serves their interest, yeah. how it'll be for, and how it how it grows out of some of the economics. There's a danger now and then where some countries just see this as the United States either lecturing to them or trying to hit them over the head, and in that environment, you know, then the opponents of these will just take advantage of it. So I I think one of the challenges for American diplomacy is the new American era of 1776. What's the mix between our interest as a new country, and now one with some two centuries of experience, and what degree is it the ongoing idea? Thank you very much. Now, Ed is an experienced yeah. person will yeah. say, if you did take out a dollar and look at it, please drop it in the basket. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this has been an extraordinary well, opportunity to uh, uh, share some thoughts with you, and we're most grateful to you for being with us today, Bob. Thank you. I think we have a few minutes for some sure. Q&A. Uh, yes. And maybe if you and just please identify you yourself. Yeah. Yes, yes. OK. We have one there, and then this lady in the front. OK? Yes, sir. OK. Please. Greg Rehold from Radio Free Asia, uh, Mr. Solik. Um, I just want to have a very brief question. In your mind, of the Chinese leaders, uh, if you could imagine or if you could advise, what would be their biggest uh, headache at this moment in terms of uh, their economy, uh, security, or the anti-corruption campaign? So in their mind, what is the toughest thing that they, they, they scratch their head that uh, they, they think they should, or better, do it better? So uh, the, the situation in Asia and the relationship with American could, would go more smoothly. Well, you said in their mind. And that's important because obviously there are 
huge issues in the environment. There's a need for structural reforms in the economy. <clears throat> the list that the Chinese leadership has to deal with is quite extensive. I, I remember President Bush asking President Hu, what keeps you up at night? And he said, finding jobs for 30 million people a year. Now that's changed, actually. Last year, for the first time, China's labor force is starting to shrink. So now it isn't necessarily finding jobs, but it's finding jobs that are higher value added and dealing with an aging society before it becomes rich. But if you ask the Chinese leader, at least Xi Jinping, I think what he'd say is his number one challenge is to reform the Communist Party. And what I, what I remind people with Xi Jinping is that while he focuses on economic reforms, that his number one goal is the preservation, and in his mind, the re reformation of the Communist Party. As a good example of this, when he took power, the party prepared a documentary film on Gorbachev and the end of the Soviet Union. And unlike in Europe, where Gorbachev would be seen as a hero, in this documentary, he's the loser who left the Communist Party, broke up his country, ruined it. And the clear message for all the cadres that were supposed to watch this was, it's not going to happen here. When I saw Xi Jinping, who I'd met on a number of occasions, starting out when he was a party secretary in Hangzhou, um, when, as president, about a year ago, I was with uh, Lloyd Blankfein and Hank Paulson, and I was trying to ask a little bit about the economic development, and he kept coming back to the 86.68 million members of the party. I remember because the numbers were transverse, so I could remember that. And <laughs> that was not just a deferring answer. I think for him, he believes they play the key role in leading the reform system. And that's where the anti-corruption campaign, in my view, is not going away. It's clearly also a way of consolidating power, but it's his view of, of dealing with it. And so if, if, this is one historical comparison most people haven't drawn, and it's one to reflect on. And Gorbachev, in the mid-'80s, said, I've got to change this country, and I can't rely on the Communist Party. It's too ossified. So he started Glasnost to try to open up the system from the outside. Xi Jinping obviously is in a stronger situation, but he knows China has to change structurally, economically, and others. So he says, I'm going to reform and drive change in the Communist Party. We'll see how that happens. And, but it also relates to the legitimacy of the Communist Party. And that's where these other issues come into effect, the environmental side. If, if people are worried about their health of their children, if they see the air they breathe, if, if, if future generations of Chinese don't feel that they're going to have the economic benefits. And then that actually goes a little bit to the security issues, which is that as China has risen, you know, the Deng Xiaoping approach was, you know, take a low profile and sort of, uh, sort of build our strength. Well, that obviously has now been at least tested by some others. And that whether that becomes a form of nationalism that becomes a support for the party or whether that's a, a, a derivative of these, of sort of a stronger China, those are the sort of issues that, frankly, the United States and others in the region need to try to have discussions with China, even though there's not always going to be agreement. So I didn't answer what I think is the number one priority, but I, you said what is their priority, and I think that is Xi Jinping's priority. Okay, ma'am. Um, thank you so much for your discussion. Jennifer Chen, reporter with Shenzhen Media Group China. Just as Dr. Edwin mentioned, the U.S. was sending a Navy destroyer into waters claimed by Beijing. So also Pentagon officials said it's the first such operation since 2012 would be the first of many. So we know Xi Obama summit did produce a closer U.S.-China strategic cooperation. So in your mind, what better U.S.-China relations regarding to South China Sea may look like to stabilize the regional peace? And also the um, sending uh, worship was deemed as very provocative by Chinese officials. So how do you think the action of U.S.? Thank you very much. Well, first, <coughs> I'm not the best resource on this, but from what I read in the paper and the discussions that I've had with people in the U.S. government, I think that this issue of the South China Sea was not one where there was much constructive movement during the discussions. <clears throat> and talking to some friends in Britain that took part in a small discussion with President Xi, he basically was referring to South China Sea as a Chinese lake. 
this goes back to the discussions that Dr. Fuller and I had, uh, I don't think that is going to be acceptable to Japan, countries in Southeast Asia, the United States, India, not just because of territorial claims, but because of the critical role of that region in terms of freedom of the seas and navigation. So to bring to US policy, this is a good example of where I think the United States needs to be straightforward with China, but also direct without being belligerent. And what I would do is to, to emphasize again the common interest in freedom of navigation, which is in China's interest too. It's part of China's economic success. It's where it gets a lot of its energy and others. But then I would say uh, the United States does not take a position on whose island belongs to whom. But in freedom of navigation, we will move beyond 12 miles, and within 12 miles, if under international law, it's a reef that wasn't really counted as an island. What I would probably do for the ones that are real islands is whether it's the Philippines or Vietnamese or others, I wouldn't necessarily go in 12 miles in that because I would be saying, we're not taking a position on whose that is. We are taking a view that you should resolve the disputes peacefully, but I would be explaining to the Chinese why we would be going through the straits and why we would be going in 12 miles where it's a reef that's been built into an island that doesn't count. It's a good example, though, that the U.S. should do this in cooperation with others in the region, and you've seen some of that in the ASEAN and other discussions. China's never been very clear about the nine-dash line, I mean, and kind of what its full extent is, which is another reach. <laughs> and since we start out with a little bit of history, let me close the answer to this little bit of history, and it shows the wonderful sense of fate. Um, in the past year, I had a session with one of the Taiwanese representatives in Washington. And as you may know, the nine-dash line actually originates uh, with the Republic of China. And uh, the story behind this is that after World War II, the United States had some surplus destroyers. We wanted to support the Republic of China. We gave these ships to the Republic of China. It was in the midst of a civil war. It didn't really have a big use for a, new, uh, a blue water navy. It sent the destroyers on this charting mission. And so the whole origin of this goes back to the Republic of China in 1947. That's obviously one of the sensitivities for the People's Republic of China. And of course, the real data on all the ships and their sailing is actually held in Taipei. So in a sense, by giving those surplus destroyers to the Republic of China in 47, we, we did created it. the problem. We did it to ourselves. Yeah. Sir. I want to know your experience. Could you your just name, introduce my, my name is uh, Mahmoud Hassan al Karim. I'm from Bangladesh. I want to know your experience about democracy, economic development, and corruption of Bangladesh. Do you think USA has 50 state and one federal state government? There are 50 bicameral parliament in USA. Do you think bicameral parliament is helpful for democratic development in Bangladesh? Um, I, I don't think either I or the U.S. should presume about uh, which democratic structures. Um, when I was dealing with the events at the end of the Cold War, I remember some fascinating discussions with some of the Eastern European countries about parliamentary systems, whether you should have a French type of presidency at that time or U.S. type of presidency. There are many roads to Rome, <laughs> so, so I think that that is really up to each country uh, to determine in its uh, civic culture. The issue that you alluded to is the one of uh, the corruption in Bangladesh. And I found this very sad and frustrating because I found the people of Bangladesh to be extremely hardworking. I found Bangladeshis all around the world that had great contributions. I saw in the textile and apparel sector, which was very difficult circumstances for people, but still created a better living that the Bangladesh could be connected to the international economy. But the political tension between the two main parties and the two women in those parties was so deadly. One of the other lessons of democracy, which we also have to keep relearning, is, is that you know there is a role for minorities and there is a role for peaceful handing over of power and you know 
just because you disagree doesn't mean they have to be a mortal enemy. It's a bigger point. Look for the U.S. too. I work with people in the Congress. I keep trying to remember, remind people, you know, in our own discussions, these are Americans too. You know, to be honest, if you're in a conflict, they're in a foxhole with you. So be careful a little bit here. Um, but so in Bangladesh, the civic system has not really sort of created that political space. And on the, the corruption side, you know, I just, I think that it's inhibited the possibilities for a lot of people. And so you, you know, this is where, as, as Dr. Fuller and I are saying, there's not one straight path. When I started with the World Bank, there was a, a sort of a uh, sort of military, civilian authority that had been put in place by the military after one of the coups. And of course, it passed on and, and was seen in bad terms. But a lot of what they were trying to do was actually pretty reasonable stuff. Um, and they were trying to clean up the system. So ultimately, these will be the challenges for the Bangladeshi people, not for the Americans. As Dr. Fuller and I said, when the, if the Bangladeshi people strive to reform this, I hope the United States will figure out ways to support and help them, including on these rule of law issues. So let me give you a more positive analogy. We saw in Central America, and you've seen in, seen in Brazil, that some efforts that uh, the U.S. has made to try to help develop independent prosecutorial authorities have been, had an amazing success. I mean, this, uh, the authorities on Honduras deposed a corrupt president. Um, without passing judgment on the president in Brazil, the fact you have a prosecutor who's partly had experience at the United States and others are moving and transforming the system. So th this is, goes back a little bit to the point that Dr. Fulner made about some of this is building for the long term. It won't all happen overnight. We shouldn't be embarrassed that it doesn't happen overnight, but we should continue to invest in it. Thank you, Bob. Last question here. I'm Sujin Park from South Korea. I'm working at Korea Economic Daily newspaper. Uh, I wanted to ask you the opinion about the South China Sea. Uh, as you know, uh, there was a, uh, South Korea and the United States summit October 16th. At that, at that moment, uh, President Barack Obama demanded if the South uh, China uh, not not uh, designate the na name, but if the, any country break the law in break the law in the rule, uh, um, international law, Korea should uh, speak out and in the line with the United States. Uh, that means the is a, is a, is about the uh, South China Sea. We uh, understand. But because uh, South Korea is a very complicated situation, as you know, we demand to the in the line with China because we wanted to reunification with North Korea. That we need help from China, but we also have a good relations and uh, ally, uh, ally with the uh, United States. So we are very complicated, complicated situation. So in this in this situation, what is the reasonable and uh, good strategy with uh, South South Korea to United States and uh, China? It's a very good question. Uh, I was in Korea earlier this year, and I had some discussions um, with senior officials, and had a chance to meet with President Park. Uh, I met with a senior delegation of Korean members of the assembly, including the Madam Na, who chairs the Foreign Relations Committee. And the first starting point was, it's very important for Korea's democratic representatives and people in the United States to discuss these topics, because they're, as you said, they're sensitive. And I think both, both sides will better appreciate some of the sensitivities as they work towards it. Second, as I mentioned real quickly in my comment with Dr. Fulner, you know, the United States actually back in 91 and 92 worked with the Republic of Korea to bring China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong into APEC and then tried to support South Korea's relationship with China. Or with China. So I think Americans recognize the importance of South Korea having a good relationship with China. And I discovered some Koreans that were sensitive to say, you know, the fact that Madam Park went to the 70th anniversary and other things. 
My, my own sense is most Americans recognize why uh, Korea is doing that, and they also appreciate that given uncertainties with North Korea, these are sensible things as long as we do it in concert, where we're continuing to sort of reflect our, whether it's our sort of military command or other issues. Having said that, and I've encountered no different view on this from the Koreans I've talked to, it's important that Korea recognize that there's some key aspects of the international system and Korean security system that will be important for Korea not to waffle on. So I actually, I, I don't know what they said about the South China Sea. I think the most important one is actually missile defense. Because going back to China, one of the points we need to make to China about the Pyongyang regime is to say, look, you just have to understand if they've got nuclear weapons and they start to develop longer range missiles, it's not only a question of protection for Korea and Japan, but this could sort of hit our homeland. We're going to develop defensive arrangements. Mm. Now, you and China may not like that, but then go look at the source of the problem. So, and my sense is that Korea and the United States have worked cooperatively on that, although there hasn't been a final decision or disposition. Um, now, on the South China Sea, though, I would make a, a version of the same point. South Korea would not be in good shape if, if the South China Sea were not open to navigation. So I think it's the sort of point where I don't expect that the United States expects Seoul to go be leading the charge, but it should speak up for those sort of principles uh, in, in the international system. But as I said, I'd also think that it's important, and I do think that the United States across administrations has recognized that, of course, South Korea needs a good relationship with China. And frankly, it's, a, it's an interesting development that Xi will go to Seoul before he goes to Pyongyang, and maybe this will start to change effect in behavior in Pyongyang. Mm -hmm. So it's exactly that type of partnership where Americans need to understand Korean sensitivities, and Koreans need to realize that, I, I'm sorry to be blunt about it, but at the end of the day, the United States is your best protector. So while you want to have a relationship with China, you know, recall who fought with you in 1950. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, for your insightful you. comments here. Let me, Ladies uh, and gentlemen, thank you. Let me you just, for uh, Walter? Uh, Director of the Asian Studies Center here, Walter Lohman, it's my job to draw the proceedings to a close, which I will do very quickly. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, Ambassador Zellig for being here today. Um, it was really a remarkable discussion in its breadth and its, uh, and its vision uh, from everything from the Federalist Papers to U.S.-China relations. Uh, I'm really struck by the conversation on U.S.-China relations because it gets to some of the complexity involved in that, in, in that set of issues. Um, with that, uh, let me thank you all for joining as well, and please join us outside for some refreshments. Thank you. Thank you.